Welcome to MSO's sixth webinar of 2023, Navigating the Complexities of Aging Care for Yourself, Your Family, and Your Clients, presented by Nancy May from Manity. All attendees will be muted. If you have questions or comments or concerns, please enter them in the chat or the Q&A. As a special treat for attending today, you are eligible to win a copy of Nancy's book. And there, there it is, How to Survive Medical Emergencies. Highly recommended. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors that, that help us all year round with all of our events. They're list, listed on our website. They help us provide these quality educational webinars, educational seminars, and golf outing. Sponsorship opportunities are always available. Contact us for information. As many of you know, we are pleased to offer at least eight webinars each year. Our next webinar, Defending Transportation Claims, will be presented by John Anello from Callahan and Fusco. And one more webinar, De-Stress for Success, will be presented by our own Mary Beagle in December. We are currently working on the schedule for 2024 and welcome suggestions for presenters and topics for our webinars. We're hoping to offer CE for some of these. If you missed any previous webinars, they are available for on-demand viewing on our website, www.msonet.com. It will be available on our new YouTube channel in the future, and I'll be putting the YouTube link in the chat in a minute. This year's educational seminar will be held virtually on November 15th, 14th and 15th. Two one-hour sessions will be held each day. Topics are handling data breaches, cybersecurity, cyber anatomy of a first-party claim, and ransomware and you, not perfect together. New this year, the ed seminars are free to all. CE credits will be available in Pennsylvania, De Delaware, New Jersey, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and they are pending in several other states. Contact us for more information about the other training that opportunities that we have. Now on to today's presentation. Nancy May is CEO and founder of CareMinity LLC. She has led a distinguished career as a trusted advisor to some of the nation's most prominent corporations, CEOs, and boards of directors, and has been recognized as one of America's top governance experts by Forbes. She leveraged professional experience and the needs of her own parents to crack the code of the aging care industry. She lived it herself. She knows what she's talking about. A respected speaker, lecturer, and trusted advisor, Nancy specializes in guiding families who are physically, emotionally, and financially challenged in caring for and protecting their aging parents. As host of the top-rated podcast, Elder Care Success, Nancy offers practical, engaging, and compassionate advice to caregivers worldwide. Her expertise is frequently sought after by national and international business and professional organizations, industry experts, and universities, where she serves as lecturer, presenter, and media guest. Nancy witnessed how professionals in various fields exploited and nearly destroyed her elderly parents. Once given authority as power of attorney and trustee, she intervened. And now she's going to tell you how you can help your own parents. Nancy? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here with you and everybody at MSO. I feel like we're old friends um, from many, many years back. But in any case... Our uh, discussion today is talking about navigating the complexities of aging care, not just for our folks, but actually for ourselves too, because we're the ones who are doing the heavy lifting. And let me see. And in other words, how not to get screw glued and tattooed while caring for your aging parents or loved ones. <laughs> I mentioned this to Jen and she says, oh, please use that title, will you? So I did. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. So um, as you heard in the opening, I'm Nancy May, and I am the eldest daughter of two great parents who have now since sadly passed. But my background is in corporate governance, working with CEOs and public companies. And I had another podcast called um, uh, Boardroom's Best which uh, was up there in the in the top level too. But as noted, I became an elder care expert pretty quickly in managing the tricks and the traps and the uh, screw glued and tattooed of everything that was going on. And within a short period of time, I learned that my parents had been taken advantage of by some very astute financial advisors, an attorney that worked with them, as well as a CPA and others. And within a relatively short period of time, 
the cost of their care in an aging care community, which they wanted to go to, to not to be a burden to my sister and myself, and I greatly appreciate, had escalated to over $30,000 a month, with which was $360,000 a year and growing. And so that is where the, oh my God, what do we do next so that they don't end up destitute. And I didn't actually have an extra $30,000 laying around to sort of just disperse as a care package to mom and dad. Um, there is so much that's going on in this particular industry that I think it's helpful for us to even know what's happening in general to our peers. And um, I read a recent report that, although they said, I think it's 20, 20, 2050, that there will be more people who are over 65 years of old than there are under 65 years of old of, of age. So this wave is not declining as we might think it is, it's actually increasing. And the next generation is gonna be even um, more challenged with what's going on. So right now, about 24, uh, about 40% of us are quitting our jobs or retiring early. And that on average, even in the younger generation is equating to or mounting to over $360,000 in the course of a lifetime career. And people are not able to recoup that considering everything that has to go out as well. Um, we are also finding that the Gen X and the sandwich generation are becoming even more financially challenged because not only are they pushing back on their careers or staving things off or pushing things off, but they're also caring for their own kids or even adult kids who are challenged and trying to figure out what to do in this particular economy. And even more are spending a certain percentage of their income. I think the average I heard now was anywhere between 10 to 15, even 30% of their own income in supplementing the cost of a parent's care. So that is becoming a rather large burden on the next generation of caregivers. And sadly, I would say that our parents probably didn't have as much to deal with this if our parents were of the World War II generation because grandparents died earlier. So I want to go on to where we said this whole thing sort of starts, because I say there are actually five aspects of caregiving. The first is when we kind of think something's going on, but it's not really going on. We're sort of getting ready for it. You know, the next is where things start to get a little wonky and we start pushing back and seeing, you know, asking questions of what's happening. The third is when we're neck deep in it or <laughs> maybe well in over our heads. And I say that's sort of like being bipolar without even knowing what that's like, but you know, good days and they're bad days and you're up in the morning and down at night and then back up again in the morning. And then there's the, uh, the fourth stage, which is actually managing end of life, which is a whole nother emotional and uh, physical challenge. And then just because they're gone doesn't mean that your job is done. But in the beginning, a lot of problems happen because parents don't like to talk about this and we don't like to talk about end of life and what might be happening. But um, quite frankly, and we dealt with this with our in-laws as well, those small things happen and our parents don't want to be a burden to us. They don't want to tell us what's going on. In fact, we learned that my father-in-law had a five-way bypass about a month after he actually had this happen. <laughs> so things do get a little wonky in the beginning. And then when we start to insert ourselves, they become even more resistant and that becomes a problem. And then things get a little better and we go back to our normal lives until things happen. This actually just happened to uh, somebody that I'm doing some work with. And I got a call saying, mom and dad have been in a car accident. What do we do? So um, if you are a property and casualty insurance professional, which I'm pretty sure everybody else here is, I would highly recommend you check in with your clients and figure out what stage of life they are in with their folks or even worse, something like this happens and you don't know what's gonna happen next. It could be yourself, it could be a parent, it could be a relative. And typically we are just not prepared for it. Get the book too. <laughs> so where do we start? The first is really with the conversations with ourselves, our parents, our spouses. Too often we forget to even bring our family, the rest of our family in on this conversation with our folks because it's difficult and it's an emotional discussion. 
Um, I had a friend who said, geez, Nance, we we're thinking about doing this. And they actually went on a long road trip with their adult kids or their kids were in college. And I think there were about five or six of them in this van. And so they all decided to plan on what they wanted at the end of lives. And they made it, they made it into a road trip discussion. And they learned a lot about uh, their kids and their kids learned about themselves as well in that course of that. But the key here really was that everybody had at least an understanding on how to start that conversation. But we talk about things like what happens next? You know, what do we want to do? Where do we want to live? What happens if money runs out and where we get the support? I'm a real advocate of making sure that everybody understands that our career network is not where we need to end in this particular point in life, but we actually need to build a care network as well. And that's pretty stressful to do, and it's slightly different. But in any case, um, then there's other questions of what happens if, I call it the scenario planning, and most business professionals understand that. But I also say that taking care of an aging parent or a loved one is like running a small, highly complex enterprise. So think about that. You've got assets, you've got clients, you have parents, you've got customers, you've got vendors. And that's a key in making this just a little bit easier and more organized. But before we move forward, I'm going to say if you want a quick stage, early stage guide on what to do and how to ask some of these questions and even make sure that you yourself are prepared to take on this role of a POA or an attorney, in fact, in taking care of a parent, please just send me a note and say, hey, I want that guide. Send it to nancy at caremanity.com and I will send you this checklist. I can guarantee these are questions that you're probably not even thinking about along the road because you do have the right to say yes or no to this responsibility and even some of the tough questions that you need to consider asking yourself along the way. Now I'm gonna dive into the issue of money. Um, this is a tough one because like I said, $30,000 a month is, is uh, a big chunk of change. And just last week, I was talking to somebody who said, yep, I ran into the same problem. And he was at $25,000 a month in what was a continued care community with his folks. And they were trying to figure out now what do they do next? Because the money just wasn't going to hang on there. But parents may often think that this is, a, a, well, money's a difficult question no matter what. But money always comes first. Second is physical care and then understanding that they could actually be your biggest liability. And there are a couple of things that I will dive into a little later on, but in this particular case, if you're not comfortable talking about money, have somebody else in your family who is, because there are so many different gotchas along the way and Medicaid and Medicare will not actually be your savior. Um, as I said at the bottom there, society says that Medicaid is your fallback. That is the biggest fallacy that there possibly is. So there are a couple of things just to say, get you started. The first is deciding whether you want to live at the, or your parents want to live at home or understanding if it's going to be in a care facility. Right now, we're going to look at just living at home and setting up some guidelines and even thinking about the stages of what's going to happen along the way from the beginning to the middle to the end of life and how you manage those, those activities, um, really. And especially if you're doing this from long distance. I did it from 1,200 miles away and managed the costs as well as or unraveling the costs as well as uh, managing the aids, which I set up with a team of, we had eight at most um, with a lead, a lead aid and just kept in touch with everybody. So that was really the small business that I was running, who's the business of mom and dad, Inc., as I like to say. And it's not, uh, it's not impossible, but organization is highly, um, it's a highly complex process and something that needs to really be considered. Um, the cost of AIDS are gonna be an issue, supplies, insurance. Uh, I'm going to state here, property and casualty insurance is something that I think most families don't even consider when it can, when they can, uh, when they think about uh, taking care of parents, they just assume that everything's in place and it may not be. So here's a time where that transaction mode actually can start to become a relationship for everybody here on the call. 
contracts um, uh, are considered or, or actually critical in this particular case as well, because what we don't know about contracts can make us liable. In fact, I was just talking to a senior head of HR just the other day, and we were talking about contracts. And I said, well, you know, I know you're taking care of your folks and she's doing this long distance. I'm presuming that you're reading the contracts of what's going into the quality of their care and how they're being cared with. And she goes, oh, yes, I'm doing that. And then she paused and she says, you know, I have never read one of the contracts in the care or the relationship that I have with my folks at all, period. So 90% of us do not read the contracts. And I know that makes it sound rather cold and clinical, but I, believe me, understanding what's being signed and how to sign it and whether you should is critical. Um, one key note there, the other day I was at actually at a doctor's office myself for a, a medical checkup with a new doctor. We're new to Florida. And I read the contract that you sign before you go into the exam room. And this contract actually said they had, I was agreeing to the right to have an AI voice call me for collections if in fact I wasn't paying on time and that they could continue to do so electronically with a non-human. I crossed it out. <laughs> if they want my money and I'm not paying, somebody should pick up the phone and call me is what I said. And they had no problem. Also, even just understanding that you do not need to put your social security number or anybody's social security number on a medical contract is key. But if you are going to a facility, that is a whole nother ball of wax. Um, understanding their current and future needs <clears throat> because facilities are not always set up to do so. They will sell you like they are the Taj Mahal or the Four Seasons. That is their job. The marketing people at care facilities are just that. They are marketing people. And quite often they are contracted by an outside organization and may not even know the extent of how the details work inside the organization. There are continued care facilities. There are independent living. There are assisted living. There are medical communities. There are non-medical communities. And please, even though somebody says, this is just sort of an added note, if somebody says, don't worry, we have medical people on staff and they are one of the other facilities other than a nursing or rehab facility, they are not a medical facility. And Medicare or Medicaid may not cover any of the services that they have. So including even insurance in some cases. So take a look at that. That's why it's important to really understand what you're going into and how to understand the cost going forward and what they don't tell you about. In fact, I was talking to somebody the other day and reviewing, uh, reviewing a contract that was an 85 page contract. And one of the aspects or clauses in that said they had the right to go after and collect money or, or go for funding using this individual's name even though the money that they may have acquired or gotten would not go to their care costs. Another woman I know, actually, uh, when her mom passed, she was in one of these facilities, they had to continue to keep paying for the apartment that her mom had until that apartment was quote unquote sold. And they couldn't get somebody else in to sell it. They had to work with the care facility. So for almost two years, they paid monthly for an empty apartment until until the care facility said, well, this is a big, got to be a big burden on your family and your mom's estate. Let us take care of it and we can donate to somebody. And they said, no, 30 days later, that apartment was sold. So as I said, beware of contracts. Care contracts are designed to get you. The big business of aging care is just that. It is a business that looks at the investors first and not the care recipients first, unfortunately. And even though you are signing and you think you're signing for a parent, you may be the one that's held responsible. As I said, 90% do not read. Lawyers do not even understand how to understand or read these contracts. They know what should go in a contract to defend or support somebody, but they don't know how to negotiate a contract and what questions to ask for. And financial advisors don't do this either. Their job is to make sure ideally that you have enough assets to pay for it, not necessarily how and where to select and make sure that those contracts are working for you or that facility is working for it. And they won't even admit it. 
So I think I missed one. I'm going to go back one sec. So staying at home, 90 or 80% of us want to stay at home and I totally get it. But unfortunately, many of us will actually put a parent or a, a, a relative into a care facility in the last few years of their life. Um, unfortunately, that also tends to shorten the length of the life. The, I think the average now is anywhere between six months to a year in a care facility. So if any facility ever tells you that there's no room at the inn, don't believe it. Wait a week, wait two weeks. It will open up very quickly. <laughs> Unless you are a Medicaid recipient or your parent is a Medicaid recipient, that is a restricted number and number of beds. So that's a whole nother discussion we can have at another time. But in this particular case, if you are staying at home, please make sure, and even if you aren't, that you have a, an organized family structure and what's going on. There should only be one leader for your family who's making those decisions and arrangements and responsibilities. Work together with your parents, your siblings, and others. But just like anything, co-CEOs do not work. And as a POA or a durable power attorney or an attorney, in fact, you still need to have, well, the buck stops here or the whatever it is, the dollar stops here conversation. Understand that there's going to be conflict management issues. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be anger. There's going to be disruption. And I would recommend that you make sure that when that happens, you start having those conversations early before they become bitter. Um, the other is also knowing that if you're in a facility or even at home, you're dealing with some, side, some sort of outside vendors. Again, one family member in charge, there should be nobody going behind the scenes, who's going to who and who's doing the backstabbing or who's going around the boss, so to speak. And uh, if that's happening, you get rid of those staff members very quickly. Um, I'm presuming that most people here are employing uh, others. As they say in the corporate world, you hire slow and you fire fast. In the aid world or the elder care world, I say you hire fast and you fire fast. It's a little different. And trust that somebody who may not necessarily have as much experience as somebody else has may work better because it really comes down to values and personality and connection with the individual that they're caring for first and compassion. The rest of the stuff, the rest of the care or the age, the aid work can actually be trained fairly easily. So um, being realistic and being honest with yourself, sometimes this is the hardest thing to deal with and being uh, honest and realistic with others. Make sure that at the very beginning, you have goals and expectations to preserve the dignity for yourself and for others and maintaining your own career balance and family and protecting your own health and stress. I can't tell you how many times I woke up in the middle of the night because I left the phone, my cell phone next to my bed and I thought it rang and it didn't. <laughs> Actually, I just did uh, recorded a, a short podcast. I called it PTSC, the post, post-traumatic stress for caregivers. <laughs> and that'll be going out in a couple of weeks. But um, I really believe that there is there is this this PTSD syndrome that's going on with the caregiver world. Even if you are mentally and physically strong, it is exhausting. Um, assess all your own personal risks and liabilities. This includes especially if you're having aids or others into your own home. And I'm I'm saying this because I really think that in the course of managing the life of somebody that we love that that those later years um the role of the property and casualty insurance professional is ignored and it's something that really needs to be brought into play very early on in building part of that network that makes sure that there are no regrets and there are no um oh my god you know like what happened and why didn't we think about that type of scenario in fact, we had a, a crack in our in our um, in our driveway, and an aide had fallen and tripped. We had cameras, or she said she fell and tripped. We had cameras which said that she did not. <laughs> so, um, even understanding how to put up cameras in a home to make sure that they 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 support any any questions or concerns might be going on. 
Um, and I said, accidents do happen um, in your home or elsewhere. In fact, uh, somebody else that we're dealing with right now, uh, their parents had a car accident. It wasn't their fault, but unfortunately it has now started to exacerbate some health issues with, uh, with their mom. And neuropathy has turned into back issues, has turned into neck issues, has turned into recommendations for surgery. And the list is going on. Unfortunately, that's a slippery slope that's happening very quickly. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the ambulance chasing attorneys that are in this particular case are, are going after this is a little concerning. But making sure that the recommendations of a, an attorney or an accident um, attorney is, in fact, doing things for the best interest of a parent is key. And again, I think that really comes into the PNC role, too, especially if it was a vehicle accident in this particular case. Too often I hear the comment, but I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know is not a strategy and it's not an excuse. Um, we should really understand exactly what our parents want, what we want. We have the right to say no. We have a right to make sure that they are taken out of a facility if in fact that facility is not taking care of somebody. Just so that you know, if, if anybody has dealt with a care facility at all, the now the average is about one aide or one worker for every 17 to worst case scenario heard was 30 residents. So if you're hearing that somebody is getting private care, that means that facility and that facility management has requested and forced an individual family to hire a private aid to be on their facility and their property to take care of a parent under their umbrella. If that happens, you're going to be spending on average anywhere between $30 to $40 an hour, period. You will probably not be able to have your own um, your own choice in the aids or the agency that you work with because they do work together. And if you run out of money, mom or dad can be asked to leave. In fact, they won't be asked to leave. They'll be forced to leave. There are some serious uh, situations where agencies or facilities are actually sending elderly people to the care for, to the emergency room and then not admitting them back, not just because they don't have money, but because they say they don't have the capability or the ability to take care of somebody. So those are things we really need to be aware of at, at any point in time. Um, and again, the increased liabilities. I keep bringing that up. As much as we want to have our heads and our hearts, it's understanding how we're protecting ourselves is key and our careers. So expect the unexpected to happen. It does happen. It may not be a boating accident. It could be a car accident. It could be as simple as tripping over a street corner. It could be as simple as a fall in the house and not even knowing that it happened. And then what do you do? Um, the help I have fallen and I can't get up may not necessarily help you, but knowing what to do is key. And good things do happen. These are pictures of my folks. And uh, I have actually before and after pictures, which I did not include here, of mom and dad in, a, in this care facility. My mom had lost 60 pounds in about uh, six months and was under 100 pounds where she had never been there before in her life, I think since she was probably a teenager. And uh, she ended up with eight stitches in her head at the time that we took her out. And a head nurse who said that my parents were not their responsibility at $30,000 a month. These pictures are photos of afterwards where we ended up buying a house. So that was an asset that we, we ended up with. And, um, and these are pictures of my aides who actually dressed them up for Halloween and they had a ball. As you can see, my dad was Dr. Death on the side <laughs> and my mom was a nun. <laughs> so life goes on and the aides are terrific if you have the good ones. And, uh, like I said, you hire fast and you fire fast and you build relationships and you trust, and you know that good people are out there to help you do the right thing and get the support that you need. So my last comment is please get help before you get caught short. Give me a call. Let me partner with you and your clients and yourself and your family. And I can show you how to make this a lot easier and a lot less stressful so that you end up with no regrets and no fears and more joy and happy memories. 
And um, that's it for doing it best with elder care success. <laughs> and yeah, Nancy, care can manity. I... <laughs> as uh, the name, the name implies care manity. I changed, I made the name of the company is care manity with the idea of bringing more care and humanity back together for our, our folks and for ourselves as well. And so, uh, yes, Nancy, th that was great. Could I just throw out a couple questions that um, sure, go right ahead? Yeah. Uh, one thing you are uh, so sophisticated. I've known you for a lot. We've known each other for a long time. And uh, for those who want to, you know, you know, bring more humanity back and care and may be faced with this, where would they get good advice for elderly uh, care? The care, it's one thing, but all the insurances, because we are a group of PNC people. And, you know, you start dealing with something like this. Uh, what? Who are the good advisors for that? Is it the... The, it's it's very rare, you know. the The advisors that are out there on the insurance side are really pushing the, um, you know, the Medicare uh, insurance, so the supplemental insurance. There's very little that's being done, if at all, I've seen, on other types of insurance, other you know, other than healthcare and medical insurance. But really, when it comes to dealing with property and casualty, it's like I said earlier. It's an area that I believe um, most people forget. Or if you're going into a care facility, those facilities will say, don't worry about it. It's not an issue. We're covered. Well, here's here's one example of where I had a major concern. And it's it's our own personal story. But my folks were in this facility. And, um, and by the way, I moved them to a second facility before I moved them to a house. So it, it took a couple of steps to get there and, and get our feet settled initially. But... Um, what happened is there was a, a kitchenette, and as most people places will do, especially if they're independent or assisted living. And my dad was a big guy. Mom wasn't cooking. She was going into a state of depression and was dealing with many strokes and, and some dementia issues. And dad did not. But he thought he was helping her by bringing back those little creamers and donuts and whatnot. And he would put them in a straw basket in their kitchenette. The problem is that that straw basket was sitting on these top of an electric stove. Oh. Exactly. Exactly. Now this facility was considered like one of the best facilities in the area. They had selected it themselves, which is fine. And I came down to visit um, one day and I would, I would joke and I had nicknames for everybody. I called myself the wicked witch from the North because I would fly down from the North to Florida <laughs> and nurse ratchet and the list went on. But I went in to talk to the, uh, the, the, the facility director when I was there and I said, I've got a question. I said, what is your fire insurance? And what happens if somebody dies from fire? Oh, it'll never happen. And she walked me through and she showed me around. She showed me how the fire doors worked in the whole nine yards. And I said, that's fine. Um, until I explained exactly what was going on. I let her go down this path till I, <laughs> till I figured out that it was time to let her in on the story. And my dad doesn't know his way around the kitchen. And even if he did, you know, they had the meal down the hall. And so she wasn't going down. If he bumped into that, just the knob, the way the knobs were set up on the electric stove or in the front, not in the back, that was a disaster. And um, so I was concerned about that. Even if they had, you know, property and casualty insurance or fire insurance for that facility, I still think there probably would have been a way with a smart attorney to figure out that it was somebody's uh, somebody's fault. So I would have done, and we got them out. Um, but I would have, I did a supplementary insurance policy on that that apartment, um, the care facility as well. Yeah. So for people that are going to go that route, there they really do need to evaluate uh, all oh. of that. At they have, they have no idea. I mean, we are given, you know, a simple comp, you know, simple contract saying, you know, here's what you sign. It's no big deal. You look at the numbers, it's going to go cost of living insurance or cost of living goes up every month or every year or quarterly, whatever it is, but they don't hold true to those contracts. And you, Jan, you're an attorney, you understand, but even knowing how to read a contract and what aspects may um, actually out trump or negate another part of the contract. I um, mean, I've dealt with contract issues in, in the boardroom for years. People do not understand how to read and ask questions and even how to negotiate what's going to go on. But, um, and if you're going into a continued care facility uh, or, or a community where you might pay 
Um, in one case, somebody said they were going to pay uh, $800,000 just to get in. Well, you're paying that $800,000 to get in the door, and then you're still paying monthly, and they don't tell you how those numbers escalate. And they don't give you a Chinese menu of what could be there. And they don't tell you what could be covered or how, what could not be covered. Um, one individual, uh, they also, in the contract, it said, we have the right to decide what kind of medical care you will receive. So in essence, she was signing a contract that didn't allow her family members to be POA. Which is ludicrous, right? I have it was a, a 95 page contract. I have one other question which relates to car insurance. Um, it's a delicate balance when people are of a certain age to them to understand they should not be driving. Correct. But if they they still are, and but I mean, what what has been your experience with that? Is the easiest thing to just take the car away and um, you know, yeah. it's it's difficult. And I think it really depends upon the um, the individual that, you know, so the family member that you're dealing with. In our particular case for my my dad, um, my parents didn't drive too much. My mom gave up driving. She says, I drove you kids around for, for a lifetime. I'm not doing that. Your dad can drive. I'm done. <laughs> so that was easy yeah. with her. But my father, you know, neuropathy in the hands and feet, right? Big problem. Uh, we started by actually hiring somebody to to drive him to doctor's appointments and say, look at, you know, it's it's because sometimes a little white lies go a long way. You know, it depends upon how you want to go. I said, look, if you get a little woozy after a doctor's appointment or something, um, it'll be it, she'll be taking care of you. You'll be fine. And that and it was a way for her him to get out without having to worry about it. Um, ultimately, what we ended up doing was to manage his World War II, um, end of the baby boom, uh, end of the um, uh, depression era. I said, do you realize the cost of insurance in your car? It's like, oh my God, are you kidding? Well, I hardly drive. I shouldn't be paying that much. So um, explaining to a parent how the cost of the car insurance is escalating as they get older. Um, also with this particular case, I said, look, at mom goes with you everywhere. She's in the in the shotgun seat, as they call it, right? Yeah. And if it's not your fault that I would understand, but if somebody broadsided you and she got killed, could you live with that? So between the cost of the insurance, the cost of the care of the vehicle and the pot potential cost of losing his wife, my mom, um, that got him to stop. So uh, related to that, um, Uber drivers and protection if they take Ubers and then autonomous vehicles, because out in Arizona, they're building community they're testing it, but right. they have a lot of people, they're smaller vehicles, but, yeah. um, and, and insured of course, but um, as another way to continue to have what might appear to be freedom, um, but not. But, but then you worry about like, can they get home? do they remember where they are just because the autonomous vehicle is driving for you doesn't mean that they're going to get you back to the right house. Well, that's true. I didn't even. Right. Know. Right. Or, you know, I've, I know somebody who has a, you know, had, well, it was just last year. She got a new Tesla and um, she works for Deloitte was driving from one side of the state to the other. She put it on auto drive and the car rear ended her auto drive car rear ended the car in front of her. So, you know, yeah, I'm not, no, there's a, I'm just thinking of all the insurance nuances around this and ways that. Well, you know, even right. So even from an insurance perspective, if, um, if you hire somebody to do the driving, we had extra auto insurance, you know, accident insurance, because somebody may be driving a parent to a, to a, a medical uh, appointment, but they're still under your, you know, employ at some point doing that. So, you know, I highly recommend that that families really seriously consider all the things that could possibly happen. And, you know, we hate to think that this is a case or a time in our life where we have to worry about um, what might happen and and we're, our job should just be worrying about their health care and that they 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 don't they don't suffer in any way. But, you know, suffering could be they lose everything. Right. Right. Beyond dignity and health. 
And we have that's, another. That's even worse, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sue, so you have questions. I'm sorry. We had, we had another question. Uh, what specific authorizations, such as general power of attorney, should you have in place early on before the parent's mental or physical health gets too bad? Oh, um, it's a durable power of attorney, power of attorney, it's or attorney of fact. Um, get a medical directive, legal, financial, you know, all that. Um, talk to an elder care attorney about that. They are great on that. They are lousy at other contracts as it relates to medical things. Um, but uh, do make sure that all the assets are wrapped up as a, in a trust, if possible. If it's even if it's a small amount, I would recommend doing that, and um, and that you understand who is the. I don't believe in co-power of attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, you know, co-CEOs in the corporate world do not work. Co-power of attorneys do not work. Um, but make sure that you have those relationships with your your siblings. But even more so, you have those conversations with your parents. What do they want? My mom, my mom had said over the course of our, our lives growing up that uh, if anything happened to her where she could, she was going to be vegetable, just shoot me. So when she had a brain aneurysm and I flew down that that night, um, the emergency room doctor said, well, what do you want to do? They wanted to fly her out to do brain surgery that night. And I said, absolutely not. She's 91 years old. We're not doing that and has dementia. So um, when I got there, he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, mom said we should shoot her. <laughs> <laughs> and the doctor, not being American born, a little foreign translation there, panicked and said, we can't do that. And I said, please, you just have to understand it's a term of endearment. <laughs> <laughs> But but with my dad, my dad was a little different. My dad wanted to fight to the very end. He did not have a um, a, a DNR. In fact, he had a note in his wallet that said no DNR. And um, when it came to the time where we we just couldn't, we were trying to fight. Um, I actually went up what, against what they call uh, in non technical terms death panels in hospitals, where hospitals mm -hmm. will and doctors will refuse to provide medical care at some point in time. It mm -hmm. happens a lot more than we even know about and that we're even prepared for. But I dealt with a board member, the uh, the chief of cardiac um, surgery, their accountant. Um, it, there were like five other medical professionals, board members at this hospital that were brought in five minutes before a procedure that they were supposed to do with my dad, plus his, um, his cardiac uh, cardiologist. My dad had never had problems until really the last 10 months of his life. And I had taken the time within after knowing about this, probably about an hour before I knew that we had to do anything and what we to do it was given. I called everybody. I called the insurance provider. Um, I called friends in the industry. I called uh, Medicare to find out what it would cost and what would be covered. I cost this supplementary uh, insurance company. So I knew it was a surgery that was going to be about $30,000. I talked to my sister and I said, look, at this is what dad would want. Do you want to put up with $30,000 if in fact we have to do this ourselves? And she said, yes. So we followed up with that and we fought and they said, look, at if you want, if you don't want a death on your, on your, uh, on the table, we'll sign off and, and just saying it's okay. Cause most of them, they don't want to see, you know, death surgery and, and as a, you know, cause of death or whatever. And um, so that's part of the reason why a lot of people just don't do anything. The doctors just will, you know, it, it goes against their, their reputation. So um, understanding why uh, a medical facility, a doctor, a hospital is saying no to something is key. And, and that's important. Um, but that's, you know, so that's you mentioned insurance, but it's still, it still includes insurance and knowing what to do and knowing that you have the right to say no. We're doing it my way. Sue, have you got another question out there? No, I just, I just had a comment and people don't realize how quickly it can happen. I know from personal experience, somebody can be basically fine one night and the next morning not remember how to walk. So it's things to think about, even though you may not think it's it's time yet. Those The little things do creep up. You know, it's, it's anger that may be, um, masking something else that's happening. It could be depression, uh, not cooking, you know, uh, sleeping a lot, things that just subtle changes in, in the personality of a parent or a loved one that you really do have to watch out for. 
And then, as I said earlier, trying not to insert yourself into their lives by taking things away, but really working to partner on an emotional level with them. So you've got another question out there. Do you want to ask that oh, one? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. What can you do once parents' assets are used up and you're either in home care or facility care? <laughs> If your parents' are, assets are used up and you're in a home care or facility care, um, you'll have to go into Medicaid um, or take up the asset, pay for the asset yourself. Medicaid has a five-year look back, so it may take it may take several years, uh, it may take less than five years, and they do have expedited uh, programs and possibilities to get there. But Medicaid is run by the states individually. And each facility is only required to have a certain percentage of beds or space allocated to those individuals. You will not get better care. They will be sharing a room with somebody else. Um, this happened to a friend of mine and that I grew up with, and his mom um, was ate up everything. And he ends up, he ends up with a $150,000 bill. Um, his wife divorced him. And he is now in the process of declaring bankruptcy. He lost his job and everything else in the process. So that's the worst of the worst case. But um, just know that they will, they if you can't pay, they will ask you to leave. And they have the right to do that. And really, I, I hate to say this and be so cynical about it, but most facilities, they really don't care. Their job is to make sure that your parents die as close to that zero balance line as possible. Wow. Any other quest questions, comments? And now for that uplifting message. <laughs> 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 really, really, it, it comes down to... to to honestly, you know, working um, with somebody like myself who understands how to negotiate, what's going on, how to determine where your the assets are, what's going to happen over the course of time, reading those contracts and know where you're going to get, as we said in the beginning, screw glued and tattooed, and understanding how they pitch and sell. Yeah. Also, it's important to understand you can do all the research on a facility and think it's perfect, but most of them. I'd say probably 90 or to almost now, probably 100% of them, in those clauses that you sign, you sign an arbitration contract, which means that if there's a complaint and they lose, arbitration judgments are not made public. So you really have no idea what goes on behind the scenes in many cases, unless it is a public situation. And, um, and those are very difficult to find. So doing your due diligence and really understanding what you're signing and where what they're not sharing with you is key. And even understanding the type of, of entity that it is. So one, I do a little secret shopping on care facilities every now and then, <laughs> and <laughs> not Nordstrom's, unfortunately, but care facilities. And one particular facility that I remember going to said, well, if you sign a six month contract, then we don't have to tar charge you um, hotel or hospitality tax. And I said, why would you do that? She said, well, here's the deal. We are a, um, we're a, a, a timeshare structure. And because the building is a timeshare and you, although it's turned into an assisted or independent living facility, we decided not to change the entity um, or the holding structure. So um, therefore we're still a timeshare business um, and you're just renting the, the apartment as a care facility. Huh. Yeah. Sue, other, other questions or if I- I don't if, see any further questions. If I could just jump in, um, Nancy May is a long time uh, business and personal friend of mine and I'm I know her from the governance world originally, but um, I think this was a really timely and great. And um, it's sad that we have to think of these things, but much better to hear someone who's experienced it and knowledgeable. And, and there are things that we can do. It doesn't have to all be uh, necessarily a, a bad experience. Uh, right. Do as and, but it was excellent, Nancy. We really appreciate it. Um, we do and, do, have... and do go, you know, send me a note, Nancy at caremanity.com, and I will give you that, um, you know, the PDF to really to ask those questions on what do I want to take this on? And some of the serious things are there are six questions you really should ask yourself before you agree 
to be um, a POA? So um, to the audience, uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Sue and, and Mary for uh, pitching it and all the attendees. And uh, Sue, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, we uh, will be contacting e each of you. We do have books available just to send to you. And we'll just have to I'll just have to email you and make sure we have your if, if you're interested in the book, give us your mailing address and we will get make sure it gets to you. And excellent. Uh, so thank you so much, Nancy, for doing that. Uh, thank thank you. And like I said, you know, don't uh, you know, don't uh, forget to to reach out and let me know how I can be of support to you and, and your clients, because, you know, by looking at partnering with with folks like yourself to help you make sure that that the relationship is is key for what you're doing as well because like i said too many people forget that pnc is is so important at this point in time yep i agree <laughs> yeah sue uh you got a close that's it uh, thank you all again for our spot thank you our sponsors thank you to our attendees thank you nancy for an excellent presentation uh thank you to our team who makes this all possible and please join us next week october 17th for defending the transportation claim and sign up for our educational seminars on number four, november 14th and 15th and uh, the link for the youtube channel it was put in the chat and we'd be happy to see your comments and re reactions and feedback on what we've got on the youtube channel because it's brand new and we're trying to make to make it educational for all of you thank you that's it thank you all bye bye <laughs> <laughs>